Well, um, we are uh, still in our Advent uh, series that we've titled The Power of a Name. Um, uh, we believe uh, a name carries tremendous weight. Uh, it has a lot of meaning and uh, it has implications, not just for the, the one who possesses the name, uh, but for those who are receiving that person in that name. And so uh, we've been in Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, a well-known piece of scripture, and, uh, and literally just unpacking uh, the different names that Isaiah gives to Jesus. So we've already seen uh, that this, this child, this son that is spoken of here is Jesus himself. It is a prophecy 700 years before Jesus shows up here on earth, and, and already Isaiah is going, here who he here is who he is, oh, English, um, and, and, and just unpacking it. And so what we've done is we've literally taken every single name and, and taken it apart and just seeking to understand what it means, uh, what it means in the text, but then what it means for us here today. And so uh, we kicked off our sermon series uh, looking at Jesus as our wonderful counselor. As our wonderful counselor. And then last week, we unpacked the title, Mighty God, El Gabor, and just what that means for us, that, that Jesus is our God warrior. And, and so uh, this morning, we're looking at the third title uh, that Isaiah gives us, and that is Everlasting Father, Everlasting Father. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the text again. Uh, I'm going to do it every Sunday until the, the series is done. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me. Uh, and then we'll jump into God's word. And so hear these words of our father, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. These are ancient words. They are old words, but they are not dead words. They are very much alive. And so God, would you engage us with your word? Would you meet us where we are? Would you help us to see you for all that you are, the beauty and the majesty that is Jesus? Lord, I pray for every single heart here this morning. I pray that they would leave here different to how they walked in because Holy Spirit, you are at work even right now. I pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy, but you come. You come as the good shepherd to give life and life to the full. And so would you give it? Would you open up our hands, open up our hearts, open up our minds to you? It's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king, you are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Everlasting Father. Now, in the translation that I just read to you, the one that we preach predominantly out of here at Rooted Fellowship, the Christian Standard Bible, it says eternal Father. But I know many of you would know it as the everlasting Father. Nothing wrong with that, but permit me to unpack a little bit of it. He will be named in the Christian Standard Bible eternal Father. I think eternal father is a better translation than everlasting father if we're looking at Hebrew to English. Again, nothing wrong with everlasting father, but I think it is a better translation if we're going from Hebrew, the original language, to English. I think eternal father is better. See, everlasting father, Father tends to create confusion that Jesus, uh, the Son, the third person of the Trinity, is also God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. Uh, people tend to go, is, is that the same? Is that what Isaiah is saying? Is he saying it's exactly the same? And if you were with us a couple of weeks ago, you'd remember that we unpacked the doctrine of the Trinity. We, we looked at it closely to understand God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in our sermon series that we titled, We Are All Theologians. 
So I won't go too much into this, but rather encourage you to go and listen to that message if you want clarity on the Trinity. But but when folks read Everlasting Father, there is that tendency to make the confusion that, that Isaiah is saying that Jesus is exactly the Father. But here's what we believe about the Trinity. We believe that there is one living true God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That these three, the Trinity, are equal in essence, in power, and in glory, and yet are distinct in function. Right? So it's what we believe. We see it in Scripture. And so to call Jesus the everlasting Father can create a non-distinction between the Father and the Son. It can. Let's be honest, it can. However, Isaiah is not trying to create confusion. Not at all. He can sometimes, I I think, write like like Paul the Apostle. Like his style of writing is, is very much like Paul the Apostle, where he takes liberty with language. And he breaks tons of grammatical rules, but his theology is always, 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 always beautiful. Always beautiful. You see, the phrase commonly known as everlasting father in the Hebrew is aviad. Aviad. Which actually translates to father of eternity. Father of eternity. Which is meant to imply that he is the possessor of eternity. That's what it means, aviad. But don't get me wrong, Jesus is eternal. Jesus is everlasting. However, he is not God the Father, but rather he is God the Son. There is a difference. And so I don't want us to get confused on this. See, the Christian Standard Bible, I believe, attempts to clarify this by referring to Jesus in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, as the eternal father. Not the everlasting, but the eternal father. Because Aviad is the father of eternity. However, the father of eternity, you see, I think it gives us more to work with. If we call it what it is, if we just go from Hebrew to English, direct translation, the father of eternity, if we understand it that way, I think it gives us more to work with. It it helps us to, to understand who Jesus is in the text. I believe it points us to a better understanding, a better understanding of what this title implies that Isaiah gives to us, the promised Messiah. I believe Everlasting Father points us to a Father who lives forever, whereas Father of Eternity, Aviad, points us to the Creator of Eternity, the the one who owns Eternity. And here's the thing, the one who creates Eternity must be able to live forever. So I'm not taking away the fact that Jesus lives forever. Now, I'm not doing that, but I'm saying, no, 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 he's, he's the creator of eternity, which by implication means that he is eternal. So in essence, it does not take away from his deity or divinity. But I believe the father of eternity points us to his purpose of eternal existence. Friends, we're just literally just unpacking layer after layer after layer because I want you to be absolutely clear on who Jesus is in this text. Father of eternity means eternity exists because Jesus Christ exists. Father of eternity means time itself is only possible because Jesus Christ exists. Breaking up of eternity into chunks of time like we do is only possible because Jesus Christ exists. He is the father of eternity. If Jesus Christ were to cease to exist, then all of time, space, and life would cease to exist. This is why he's the aviad. This is why he is the father of eternity, the, the creator of eternity. But you might be sitting here and asking, Ane, hold on, I thought God created everything. My answer to you would be, Yes, he did. 
Yes, he did. And then you might go, but, but are you seeking to make the point that Jesus is the father of eternity? And if so, therefore the creator of eternity, hence he is the creator. Is that what you're trying to say? Like, like are you trying to make the point as father of eternity, therefore he's the creator of eternity, therefore he's the creator of all things? Is that what you're trying to say? My answer would be, yes. Yes. See, this is one of the, the beautiful and mysterious things of the Trinity. We spoke about it when we unpacked the Trinity. It's, it's, it's mysterious. It's, it's to, for us to try to, to go, I'm going to wrap my mind around this and fully understand it. Remember what I said. It's like you going to the ocean and then uh, putting your hands together like this and, and getting a cup of water from the ocean and going, now I fully understand the ocean. It's foolishness. It's ignorance. It's one of the mysteries that, yes, God is the creator, but then we're also being told that Jesus, the father of eternity, is also the creator. And think about this. I haven't even started to unpack how God the Holy Spirit fits in all of this. But we're not going to go there. Uh, this is not the sermon for it. In fact, I just encourage you to keep coming back. <laughs> so let me, let me take a passage in the Bible, right, to make this plain. Let me take a passage in the Bible that I believe clearly communicates to us that Jesus, Jesus is the aviad, that Jesus is the father of eternity, that Jesus is the creator of eternity, that Jesus is the creator. And so with that, let's go to Colossians chapter one. Again, a very well-known piece of scripture if you've been with the church for a while, but if you are not familiar with this piece of scripture, let me read it to you. Colossians chapter 1 from verse 15 to 20. It says, He, speaking of Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place where? In everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Friends, that, that alone should just lead us to worship. Like you should go, on oh, no, stop, get the band back on, let's just worship. All of God? All of God. And through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, to make peace through his blood shed on the cross. You see, this portion of scripture loudly declares Jesus as the aviat, as the father of eternity. And there are massive, massive implications for our lives here in this text who Isaiah prophesied about 700 years before Jesus showed up, Paul, the author of these words, declares out of personal experience. He's going, what Isaiah said, I, I, I know it to be true. I know it to be true. And so I want you to know that it's true. And so let's spend some time in this text. Verse 15 says, he is the image of the invisible God, the first born over all creation. Friends, this is massive. This is massive. This tells us that if we want to know what God the Father looks like, all we have to do is look to Jesus. Yeah, and, and there's so many people who are going, you know what, I, I, I don't know if I can believe in, in, in a God who sits on a throne in heaven. I have no idea what he looks like. I don't understand. I, like, what are his attributes? I don't get it. It's like, well, hold on. It's because you've missed Jesus. Yeah. Look to Jesus. Yeah. This is massive because you could not see God and live. That's why it's huge. You, you could not see God and live. Our sin, our sin always got in the way. Always got in the way. And so when Jesus showed up, it literally changed everything. This is why we say Jesus changes everything. The gospel changes everything. Literally, we, we could not. We could not get a meeting with God. Like the things that we had to do and even still with that. Yeah. And so Jesus shows up and he goes, you know what? It's okay. I'll usher you in. 
He is the one who makes the invisible God visible. This is why Philip, one of uh, Jesus' disciples, says, listen to these words in John chapter 14. From verse 8, he says, Lord, said Philip, show us the Father and that's enough for us. (laughs) Friends, I I believe that that is the cry of every human heart. They don't use these words, but, but they're crying for that. They're crying to see the Father because they know that'll be enough. Not, not this drink I'm going to take again and again and again and again. Not the, 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 the unhealthy relationships that I'm going to find myself in. No, those things will never be enough. It is like moving from one train to the next train to the next train and wondering why. Why am I not satisfied? Because only the Father can satisfy you. Show us the Father. Show us the Father and that will be enough. And then notice what Jesus says. Jesus said to him, have I been among you all this time and you do not know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. Think about it. He's he's like, like, man, we've, we've been together. What are you missing? Is it maybe because you are trying to create your own definition of who God the Father is? That every time I give you one, you just go, no, I don't want that one. I I, I want a God who who does X, Y, Z for me. I I want a genie in a bottle kind of God. I want an ATM kind of God. I, I I want a puppy, cute and really nice that I can show to my friends kind of God. No, 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 that's that's not who God is. Jesus comes and he says, listen, here, here is who the Father is. And so if you see me, You've seen the Father. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says this, The Son, speaking of Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact, the exact impression of his nature. Maybe you don't like uh, the Christian Standard Bible. That's okay. Let's go to the New Living Translation. It says, expresses the very character of God. But maybe you're not into the NLT. No problem. ESV. The exact imprint of his nature. I'll give you one more. The NIV, the exact representation of his being. The idea is this, that Jesus is the exact, the exact likeness of who the Father is. It is like a stamp. You know, like when you stamp something and you look at the physical stamp and you look at the imprint, you're going, this is exactly the same, that I can make the connection. And many of us have, have, we think we've fallen in love with Jesus, but no, the stamp does not look like the imprint. And you might go, oh, no, no, can you really say that? Yes, I see it. I see it in the way that you worship. I see it in the way that you give. I see it in the way that you serve, in the way that you believe. Jesus exactly represents God to us. And that is beautiful. Beautiful. This is why we worship Jesus. But Paul goes on. He says, for everything was created by him. In heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. This tells us that the the child born unto us, the son given to us, that Isaiah speaks of, created everything we know and see. Jesus didn't come into existence in a stable in Bethlehem. Now, it's beautiful that he did that. Right? Like like in, 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 in the... Not in the suburbs. <laughs> Not up on the hill. So, some might even say, like, it was in the townships, in the rural places, in the informal settlements. I'll take that one. In places that are often forgotten. So that's beautiful that he came that way, but hear me, he did not come into existence then. He existed before the world was created. He existed before time began, which means he is eternal, the father of eternity, Aviad. For everything was created by him. That long before Jesus was born a baby, the son of God was there as the creator. I mean, it, it, for me, it blows my mind because it takes me to places. And, and, and if you know me, right, like I like to think uh, about things and I like to uh, think that maybe if I was a fly on the wall, just kind of walking with Jesus and his disciples and they're showing up to places and they're going, wow, look at that mountain, it's so beautiful. I mean, Jesus would be like, yeah, I know. I know it's beautiful. I put it there. 
Like, look, look, look at this, this river and, and like what it does and how it gives life. And it's just it's beautiful. And wow, Jesus, come look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And I'm sure he didn't do that, but, but I want you to understand that, that, that that's who Jesus is. That's why John tells us in his gospel account, speaking of Jesus, John chapter 1 verse 3, he says, all things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. And so friends, you can come up with the greatest thing in the world, the greatest invention, the greatest idea, and it's amazing. We'll honor you. We will. Here at Rooted Fellowship, we'll honor you. But we will not glorify you. Why? Because that idea was given to you by the creator himself. And some of us, we just need to recognize that. Humble yourself. You are not that big of a deal. Created in the image of God. But you are not that big of a deal. Not only was everything that we see created by him and through him, but we're also told that it was created for him. For him. Which in its, of itself is just... It. See, Jesus is the, is the ultimate meaning of creation. So he's not just the creator but it's the ultimate meaning of creation. Which means he's also the ultimate meaning, watch this, of our lives. It's one thing to go, okay, no, 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 yeah. The meaning of the stars and the moon, the ocean, all these beautiful things. But me, I'm the master of my own destiny. And, and yet, <laughs> we read this and we go, no. No, even you were created for him. We were made for Jesus. That means all those philosophers out there trying to make sense of life, no matter how clever or whimsical or profound their ideas or concepts may be, if they haven't gotten to Jesus as the one who is the center of it all, then they've missed the point. Stop reading the books. Stop listening to the podcast. Get back in the scriptures. All of creation is for him. And that includes us as well. Your life belongs to him. Your sexuality belongs to him. Your money belongs to him. Your emotions belong to him. All of it. That when we walk out there, literally people should look to us and go, that belongs to Jesus. When you're typing on Instagram, belongs, that comment belongs to Jesus. But, but the question is, let's be honest, does it? Does it? Would you be able to stand before Jesus and go, yeah, no, when I said that, I was representing you. Because all of creation exists for Jesus. Then our purpose, our very purpose is found in him. This is why I plead week in, week out. Week in, week out, I plead with you to give your lives to Jesus. Because you will, you will never understand the meaning of life. Never. Never. Until you have a personal encounter with Jesus and you walk with him. All of it for him. Let's keep moving. Verse 17. He is before all things. And by him all things hold together. The structure of the universe. The stuff of our bodies. This very building, the ground on which we stand, it is all held together. Not only does it belong to him, there's a lot of things that belong to you, but you do not hold it together. This is why we have insurance. <laughs> Jesus doesn't need insurance. He holds it all together. It's all sustained by Jesus. The fact that your heart beats right now. that blood is pumping to the rest of your body, that you are inhaling and exhaling. We take those things for granted, friends. We really do. All of it is sustained by him. If Jesus wasn't doing that, the universe and everything in it would simply collapse. All of it, collapse. It would cease to exist. Now, I know super clever people in here, super, super smart, 
masters degrees, PhDs. I know I made a comment a couple of weeks ago, some of you took it in a, I was honoring you, I really was. I was super honoring you guys. So clever, so smart. So some of you might go, okay, Onet, he created everything, he sustains everything, I get it, but what about science? And I would say, yeah, I also believe in science. Now I know my high school marks would probably say otherwise. <clears throat> All right, that was a different time in my life. But I do believe in science, I do. I believe science exists because Jesus holds it together. He holds every molecule together. You look at the element, is that what it's called? Elements table. You know what? You know what? Hey, I knew, I knew what it meant. It was a test. And I, and I saw some of you. You went, yes. And then you heard everyone else, no, no. No one's judging you guys. Some of us took art. <laughs> but, but don't take my word. Let me, let me offer you some words of some really clever people, some scientists who have done some amazing things. In fact, we are still benefiting from them today. Uh, there's a, an individual called Werner von Braun, who was a pioneer of space rockets. Lived in 19, born 1912 to 1977. He says this, an, an outlook at the vast mysteries of the universe should only confirm our belief in the certainty of its creator. Scientific concepts exist only in the minds of men. Behind these concepts lies the reality which is being revealed to us, but only by the grace of God. Another scientist called Paul Davies contributed to the black hole and the big bang theories. He says, the law of physics seem themselves to be the product of exceedingly beautiful design. Beautiful design. He says, the, the, this is overwhelming. It's so overwhelming that I must believe in one who is in control and creator of it all. Isaac Newton. We all know Isaac Newton. He says, the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. He holds it all together. Verse 18, he is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. Aviat. Every church is Jesus' church. I know we put fancy names to them, Saint so-and-so and Rooted Fellowship and Renovation Church, like, and, and I'm all for it. But at the end of the day, every single church, every Bible-believing church belongs to Jesus. Amen. It is from his side that the church was birthed. Yeah. See, when the Roman soldiers pierced Jesus' side, out came what? Blood and water. Two elements came out of the Lord's pierced side, blood and water. See, blood is for our redemption. It deals with sin. It's for the purchasing of God's people, the church. Water is for giving life to deal with death. This is what produces the church from his side. Why does the church belong to Jesus? It's because from his side that we come from. Birthed from his side. Friends, where did Eve come from? From the side of Adam. But you see, where Adam failed his bride, Jesus came through for his. This is why we put him first place. First place. He owns every single church. He says, I will build my church. And that's a message, not just for me, but even leaders here who sometimes I think we get our grubby hands on the church. I will build my church. You get in line. And you believe in me as the wonderful counselor, as the mighty God, as the, as the aviad. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Oh my. The fullness of God is in Jesus Christ. The fullness of God is in Jesus Christ. Not in a building, not in a pastor or a leader, 
not in a song, not in a sacrament, not in a theology, not in a method or curriculum, but in Jesus Christ himself. We can make idols of what we do. We can show up, we can sing the amazing songs. We can have incredible ministries. But I'm telling you, if Jesus is not at the center of those things, then it means absolutely nothing. It is in him, in him, the fullness of God dwells. And so again, it says that, man, if you want to experience God, then you need to go to Jesus. You cannot bypass him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through him. And we try. We, we try with fancy words and really cool hashtags. But if you want to get to the Father, you have to go through the Son. Let me wrap up here and call the band to come up. Verse 20, it says, And through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Paul writes, And through him to reconcile everything. See, reconciliation, reconciliation is one of the beautiful, beautiful things about the gospel that we were separated from our Father, separated from His blessing, separated from the kingdom of God. And so we needed someone to step in, to step in so that He might be able to reconcile, reconcile us back to the Father. And, he, and here Paul says, listen, he, through Him, to reconcile everything to Himself. So it's not just, it's not just us that's being reconciled. Yeah. That, that in Romans, Paul tells us that creation Creation groans. It's going, where are the children of God? Because creation is going, I want to go back to my father. I want to go back to the creator. I want to go back to the way things were. And so Jesus goes, okay, from my side, the church will come, and I will use the church to put on display who I am, the father of eternity, so that people can hear the good news of the gospel and be reconciled back to the father. A lady called Dorothy says, she says this. Whatever the answer to the problem of evil, because again, there is evil everywhere. There is evil everywhere. And so he says, whatever the answer to the problem of evil, this much is true. Not only is God the answer, but to bring health, he's the one that took the medicine. He took it on himself so that things might be reconciled back to the Father. And so I believe this is why the last title that we get of Jesus from Isaiah is that he is the Prince of Peace. Now, I don't want to get into that right now. I'm going to encourage you to show up on Christmas Day. But this word peace is more than just ceasefire between humanity. It speaks of something far greater. And Isaiah says that there is one who's able to do that, who's able to bring peace because he reconciles us back to the Father and that he reconciles all things. And so he has the ability to reconcile marriages. He has the ability to reconcile families. He has the ability to reconcile relationships. He has the ability to reconcile all things. I love, hear me, I love the constitution of this country. But it cannot do what the ministry of reconciliation brought by Jesus to us can do. And so my question to you this morning is do you believe in him? Do you believe in the one who holds all things together? Do you believe in the one who is the father of eternity, the creator of everything, the aviad? Do you? Do you believe in him? Or are you still trusting in your own abilities? The gospel, I say this often, the gospel is both information and invitation. And so it's not just things that are being communicated to you, but then there's, a, there's something that you must respond to. And so I'm going to pray in a moment. And, and if you're sitting here and you're going, hey, this is first time I'm hearing this and, and, and 
not just the intensity of it, but also the beauty of it. That, that I believe I'm a Christian because I grew up in a Christian home or I've been going to church for years. I thought that's how it works. No, it's surrendering your life to Jesus, surrendering everything to the Father of eternity and recognizing that he came and lived the life that you and I should live, but we cannot, and then died the death that you and I deserve. He took his own medicine so that we might be reconciled back to him, back to the Father. And so, Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you are not just the creator of all things, but you're also the sustainer of all things. That everything was made not just by you and through you, but it was made for you. That everything finds its purpose in you. Our very lives find purpose in you. And so I pray, I pray now, Lord, for every single heart here this morning that, that they might be able to, to leave confidently knowing that they are in your hands, that they are covered by the blood, that they've been reconciled. All of us are in desperate need of a Savior. And we thank you, God, that you sent your Son, Jesus. And so, Holy Spirit, would you have your way? in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.